Welcome to Living in the World International Church. We are here as doers of God's Word with signs and wonders following. If you want more information about our ministry, visit us at www.litweek.org or email us at info at You will never be the same again. Now it's time to listen to God's Word from Pastor Femi Alaren. Be blessed as you listen. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. Um, the testimonies are coming in, in as the aftermath of the 21 days fasting and praying. God Himself has been faithful. Uh, I believe God has been showing Himself as um, the man of war, fighting our battles, those uh, battles that are visible and those that are invisible. Um, in this season, we have been studying the, uh, the scriptures and we're looking at the subject of wisdom. And um, we, we have been looking at the subject title What is Wisdom? And we're looking at sub um, titles underneath that, and uh, we've been looking at the subject of um, um, the pillars of wisdom and what is wisdom, the foundation of wisdom. Today we shall look at the subject titled um, "Finding Wisdom in Unlikely Places." Finding wisdom in unlikely places, and I believe that God Himself will speak to us today because. Um, the year is loaded. I said that at the beginning of the year that this, this year is loaded with um, great blessings. And we have to take full advantage of it. So each month, I believe the Lord is building us up gradually, gradually, step by step, um, precept upon precept, line upon line, to get us to our final destination. So if you have missed any of the series or any of the teaching, they are freely available on the website. Um, which is www.litwick.org or listen to them on YouTube which are also free so you can use that um, you can listen to it on your iPhones and iPad and all the various gadgets and devices that you have and I believe as you begin to listen that God himself will speak to you and um, that situation in your life will become a testimony in the precious name of Jesus Christ Shall we pray? My Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we give you glory and honor. We bless your holy name because you're faithful and there's no one like you. Thank you for the abundance of mercies that we have received. Thank you, Lord, for the goodness that we have received. Thank you, Lord, for the testimonies that we have received. Thank you for the battles that you have fought on our behalf. Thank you for the miracles, O oh Lord. Thank you for the signs and the wonders in our midst. My Lord and my God, we give you all the glory and praise because we acknowledge you as our source and as our doer. King of kings, Lord of lords, as we sit at your feet to learn, we ask that our eyes of understanding be open, that you teach us your word yourself. And I pray, my Father, that each and every one of us will increase in wisdom, in knowledge and understanding, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your mighty name. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise God. Finding wisdom in unlikely places. That's a very interesting topic or title, so to say. Some years ago, I read the scriptures and I found something quite interesting in the Bible, which I thought shouldn't be there. You know, then I began to study a lot more and I began to ask the Holy Spirit questions about the scripture. Now, the scripture is found in the books of Luke chapter 16, verse 8, Luke 16, verse 8. And it says this, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. The children of this world in their generation are wiser than the children of light. And I found that scripture to be strange because we are the children of light. We are the children of light. In other words, we have access to the best of the best of God. We have access to salvation. We have access to the Holy Ghost. And if you study the scriptures in the books of Isaiah chapter 11, if you read from verse 1 to 3, it talks about the stem growing out of the root of Jesse. And one of the things he talks about having is the spirit of wisdom. And wisdom makes you wise. That's what you're supposed to do. But God is saying, and if you read your Bible, you find out Jesus Christ was the one speaking here, so it should be in red letters. And he says that the children of this world are wiser in their generation than us. How can that be? It's because, you see, the devil has found us predictable. In many ways, predictable. He knows what we are going to do. He knows how we are going to do it. You know, many of us don't look for innovation or inventive ways to tackle the situations that we face. Many of us are so predictable, so he can easily formulate a strategy to always counter, 
what we are planning. That's what he simply do, it does, rather, and he, he waits for us because he says Christians are very predictable in their ways of life. So we keep finding ourselves in the same cycle and we are thinking God is not answering prayer. That's the issue. I read a scripture in the books of uh, 4 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. 4 Samuel 16, verse 1 and 2. I read the scripture to you. He said, And the Lord said unto Samuel, He said, How long would thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? He said, Fill thy horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse, the Beth uh, Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And then Samuel said unto the Lord, He said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And then the Lord said, Anyway, He said, Take an ilfa or a sheep or ram, whatever you want to call it in the modern day. He said, With thee. And then say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. I'm not sure if that scenario plays out in your mind. I'm a man of um, vivid imagination, so to say. And as I was reading that statement, I can actually picture God and Samuel having a conversation. That Lord, you're about to send me to my death. A king, whether he's rejected or whether he's approved by God, is still a king, regardless. And he still has full might and authority to carry out an execution, whether you be a prophet or not. So Samuel was afraid for his life, number one. But number two, as I've often said that, Every situation has wisdom for it. It might be ready-made, where you actually just pick it up the shelf, or you might have to invent it yourself. And then the Lord said unto Samuel, he said, well, part of your duty as a prophet is that you make sacrifices. As a priest, you make sacrifices. So take a ram with you, and then tell him you came to sacrifice. After all, he can tell you not to perform your duty or your office. But yet, we both know what agenda that you have within you. That tells you how God diffused a situation. You see, sometimes we act so boldly, ignorantly. I believe in faith. I'm a man of faith. I've taught on faith. I mean, one of our series of teaching has been on faith. But there are wisdom for every situation. I've often told you, I've told us that... Um, Respect yourself uh, if you don't want to be disrespected, especially when you're standing with, before a man that's in uniform, whether it be a custom officer at the airport or police officer, whoever. Once they are sitting behind the desk, they are sitting behind their throne, you must respect them irrespective of who you think they are or who you think you are in the society or they will mess you up. But this is not our text for the day and I'm, I'm just laying the foundation if that's okay with us. So, wisdom in unlikely places, that I found very strange because I thought the Lord would have said, go, you are the prophet, just prophesy and say, I've come to do this. But Lord said, no, go there quietly as if you're come to do your duty as a priest and then do what I've sent you to do. He was teaching him a way out of a situation that looks so dicey and so dire. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe each and every one of us can pick a lesson from that. So that when we are faced with some situation in our place of work, or we are faced with situation in our marriages, there's some things you know, for the sake of peace, sometimes you have to keep your mouth closed. Not because you don't know what to say. Not because you don't have the words or the ammunition within your vocabulary to actually attack the person back. But because you know where you're going, you keep your mouth closed. Now, let's go to the text for today. It's found in the books of Proverbs chapter 30, verse 24 to 28. Proverbs 30, 24 to 28. Now, the scripture says there, it said, There are four things which are little upon the earth, but exceedingly wise. I want you to underline that word, exceeding wise. Exceeding wise. Now, we talk about the first one that we're going to look at. We might look at two today, and then we look at two next week. And then we'll finish up the series of wisdom um, uh, three, three weeks from now. Now he says, the ant are a people not strong. Mark the word, not strong. Yet they prepare their meat in the summer. He said, the ant are people not strong. Yet they prepare their meat in the summer. And he said, the coonies are but a feeble folk. 
yet they make their houses in the rock. And he said, 27, he said, the locals have no king, yet they go forth, all of them, by hand, by band. And the third one, the fourth one, he said, the spider has taken up his hand and is in the king's palace. Now, we look at the first one, which is the ant. He said, the ant are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. What's so funny is the ant is the least recognized um, creature, so to say, because they are so small. You know, sometimes you want to compare somebody or you want to insult somebody. You say, you're so small to me, you're like an ant. I, I will just squash you under my feet. But you see, even though we are thinking of squashing people under our feet, calling them ants, God finds wisdom in their doings. He abandons, he overlooks the eagle. Overlooks the shark, overlooks the lion, the buffalo, the elephant. Then he talks about the ant. There must be something peculiar about the ant. Now, Solomon, the wisest man ever to have lived on earth, recognized the ant as somebody who is exceedingly wise, or an animal or a living creature that's exceedingly wise. The first thing I can pick up from that lesson is that the ant are people not strong. In other words, they accept themselves for who they are. They are not strong, but I accept, they accept themselves for who they are. The first step to success, I believe, or first step, the first step to wisdom, I believe, is that sometimes we just have to accept ourselves the way we are. Many of us are fighting internal wars. In, in, in other words, we, we wish we were black. Some wish they were white. Some wish they were tall. Some wish they were short. So I wish they were a little bit, a little bit more you know, uh, robust, so to say. Let me not use the word fat. Um, robust. Let's use that word. And there's some people wish they were, you know, slightly slimmer. Accept yourself the way you are. There's nobody in the scripture that the Lord used for great works that never had limitation or some kind of issues. Moses was a stammerer, the Bible says. And he was a man of a temper as well. <laughs> the worst combination in life is a man to be a stammerer and at the same time have a temper because he won't be able to get a word out. Because he's angry and he's trying to tell you something, but yet he's stammering. Joshua was a man who was considered a coward, so to say. Because the first thing the Lord said to him, Thou man of valor, he said, Be strong and courageous. He was already strong, God would tell him to be strong. Paul the Apostle, if you want to talk about, uh, Paul was a persecutor of Christian. Perhaps he also had an infirmity somewhere because he said that three times I beseech the Lord to take this thing from me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you. So every single person in the scripture had some kind of limitation or had some kind of weakness, so to say. But yet, the Lord used it. So you accept yourself for who you are. Don't let anybody talk you down. Because once they, de they destroy your self-confidence and your self-worth, then finding wisdom or doing anything valiant will become a, a thing of a, um, like a mirage, so to say. Now, we can compare the four seasons to a man's life. The first lesson we might say we learn or we can learn from about the ant is that they are always prepared or they are always preparing. Like the Boy Scouts always say, he said, "Be prepared." Now, the four seasons of uh, of the of this of the weather can be compared to the four seasons of a man's life. In spring, you're giving birth to, and it's your youthful years. In summer, it's your manhood and maturity years. The autumn is your old age and declining years, and winter is death and in inevitable judgment that follows. Before, after death is judgment. You see, some people are so caught or so, um, so stuck in the past that their life is on a reverse gear. If you study the ant properly, they're always future thinking. Future thinking. They're not thinking about what could have been, what I should have done. The past is the past. Let the past go. Except somebody has invented a time machine, I don't see the use in talking about the past because you can't change the hand of time. For many years, I, I contemplated on actually inventing a time machine when I was younger. And I was a teenager or a kid then. So 
please pardon me. And the, the reason why I was thinking about that is I wanted to go back in time and do undo some things that I did. But you know, as I grew older, the Lord began to <laughs> talk to me about things that I think about when I was younger. And one of the things that came up was this. He said, well, you see, if you go back in time or you're asking me to roll back the hands of time, at that point in time, somebody just passed on to glory. At, just, at that point in time, somebody just went through a pain or just felt an emotion that they wish they would never feel again in their lifetime. At that point in time, somebody just lost their mother or their father or something just happened. So you have to think about the 6 billion people plus on the surface of this earth when you are asking that I should run back the hands of time. So don't dwell on the past. Don't dwell on the past. He says, on the, he, we must not live in the past that we forget the present and the future. Because once you begin to dwell on the past, you, it limits our ability to prepare for the future. Now, people are still crying over the uh, stock market bust. Some people are still crying over it. They're still wishing they never did some things. They wish they never did something. As a matter of fact, a lot of people, people became more familiar Some people became financially free because of the boom of the uh, stock market and the property market and the whatever investment that you place your money in. But some people, yes, they did lose some money. Yeah, and that's, that's the truth. But the funny thing about this whole thing is this, though. If you ever study history, not necessarily dwelling on the past, but if you look at history, you'll find out that there's always a cycle going on. A cycle. The boom and the bust. There was one in the 20s. There was one in the, uh, in the 80s, I believe. There was one in 1995, there about. And the one that just happened recently that we're still recovering from, uh, we're on a, on a recovery, uh, recovery path. So it tells us that there's a cycle. If there's a cycle, what have you done in preparing for the next cycle? How have you prepared? What are you doing to prepare for the next cycle that's coming on? You see, the story of Joseph and the famine of Egypt is similar to the, um, the wisdom of an ant. If you can study that in the books of Genesis chapter 41. Now, they had a boom. It says seven years of plenty and then there's seven years of famine. What they basically did was prepare for the famine in the years of plenty. Now that you have plenty, what are you doing for preparation? Noah was building an ark, but people were laughing at him because no one has ever seen the rain before or seen rain fall before. But suddenly, who's having the last laugh? Who was sitting in the in the in the in the in the, in the ark and wagging, and wagging his tongue at them and saying, "Nana, nana, nana, I told you." So anyway, I'm not being sarcastic. The point is this: Rejoice not over me, my enemy, for when I fall, I will rise again. Micah chapter seven verse eight. So what am I saying to you? In other words, prepare now for the future in the days of plenty. I once read a general say, uh, a general of, uh, of the, I believe the American army, he said something about the best time to prepare for war is in the time of peace. There was a time they were about to launch an attack, I think it was over Iraq um, war. And there was this general during, um, who was in the White House walking. And once they went for a briefing, he was about to walk out and they said to him, he said, General, we need you to draw us a plan for how you think we can go into battle against these people. He said, give me a second. He went into his office, um, opened his drawer, brought out a file, went to their table, said, this is the plan. He said, that was less than five minutes. He said, yes, because I wrote the plan and the contingencies and the possible outcomes of each plan and each way if we go in, in this book, while we were at peace. But now that we are at war, we might not have the time to consider all the factors. So it's time to truly prepare for the future. That is one of the wisdom of the ant. He said, David laid up treasures for his son, Solomon. He said, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Third, fourth generation. And I pray each and every one of us see our third and fourth generation, the precious name of Jesus Christ. You see, nothing catches God on our ways. If you are truly a child of God, nothing catches your father, the almighty God, on our ways. 
I said humorously some time ago, I said, with the situation of the world, if something, if the situation of the world was catching God on our, on our ways, he would have died out of that attack. Because the world is full of so many ups and downs. But you see, even the fall of man did not catch God on our ways. How do I know this? Because the Bible says in the book of Revelation 13 verse 8, it says this, that the lamp of God that was slain from the foundation of the earth. So before man even conceived that he was going to sin, God has already made plans for him to be redeemed. So aren't you glad that we serve a God that is never caught on our ways? So your situation is not catching God on our ways. For a man to be called lucky, he simply is a man that is prepared. And when he's prepared, he simply takes advantage of the opportunity that is actually given to him. Let's move on because I have a few things to share and our time uh, is far spent. We can look at the story of the, of the virgin, the ten virgins in the books of Matthew 25. Some were called foolish, some were called wise. Why? Because some prepared and some did not. And they did not know the time the bridegroom was coming. May that not be your portion. Number two, the lesson we can pick from the ant is that to perform e efficiently, we must have a plan. To perform efficiently, we must have a plan. The ant is running around, but he has a plan. It seems that he knows what he's doing. He's preparing for the future. Where there's no future or vision for the future, everybody perishes. We know that. We've talked about this several times. You see, it's a life driven by purpose. And I know many of us have read the books of um, Rick Warren. If you have not, I, I will recommend that you read it. It's like you must be focused on something. That's why we began the year by looking at the subject of vision for the year. And vision is a picture of the future that you have in your mind that you want to bring into reality. And you must have a plan to do that. You don't start building a house without having gone through an architect to help you do a plan or draw you a plan of your house. How big the rooms are how long they will be, how wide they will be, how high they will be. It's important that you have a plan. And every ant you see is busy. It's busy because it's focused on the plan. And everybody knows their part. And everybody's playing their part. And the third lesson I actually pick because of our time, I'm going to go a bit faster if that's okay, is that teamwork, to perform efficiently also, there must be participation by everybody and also there must be teamwork. He said two is better than one, the Bible says. Most of us, we use that when we are preaching about marriages and we are talking about relationship. But more and more importantly is that we talk about it in terms of teamwork. And the word team itself is an acronym for the word together everybody achieves more. Together everybody achieves more. You can't see an ant being idle. He's always busy. Always, always busy. Always busy. Always doing something. You know, let's achieve more together by putting heads together. Let's achieve more by um, doing things together. We are not, we are too, some, uh, sometimes we are too defragmented, in so, in, in, in so, so to say. So we must help ourselves. Let a helping hand work in harmony. Stay busy, stay focused on the task ahead so that we together we can achieve a greater purpose in life. When you have a team of people, especially sports, I like sports a lot, and I watch football and basketball and the rest of the sports. You see, it's a team effort that brings about the game. If one person scores, everybody gets the glory. It doesn't matter who scores the goal, but as long as the whole team wins. So if one person is dropping the ball, so to say, he's not performing his duty, the entire team is let down, not just the, the, that individual. So team effort brings about greater achievement for the overall objective. The ant is always focused. It's always busy. Use your damn time well. I was at the, at the mechanic um, the other day and I was sitting down there and I took my laptop with me and my headphones so I can listen to someone or write someone as, I, as I'm sitting down there my car's getting fixed. Use the time, damn time. Don't waste time. Time is something that we all don't have luxury of because it cannot be stored. It cannot be more. Cannot be, never be bought. It cannot be paused. It just keep going. And we are all going to give accounts of what we have done. I love the books of Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6. And I love verse 7 of that. He said about the ant. He said he has no commander, no overseer, no ruler. He said yet he stores his provision in the summer and gathers food at harvest. 
and verse six and, and verse seven and eight of Proverbs chapter six. When I read that scripture about the ant, what I discovered is that the ant is not a person or a personality or an insect that does eye service. He said he has no commander, he has no overseer. What does that mean? You see, many of us sometimes only walk when we see our bosses or when we know the whip or the axe is about to fall on our head. An ant is, a per, uh, is, a, uh, is an insect that uses the initiative to actually keep going, irrespective of whether he has somebody looking over his shoulder or not. You see, I have discovered that, especially among Africans or black people, so to say, that except they feel some kind of axe or some kind of uh, somebody over their shoulder watching over them to see them make sure they're doing the work they sometimes just goof off they goof off they just goof off and just whatever you know that is not something the ant does if you're really studying the scriptures and you're picking wisdom from the ant then you must always use your initiative whether your boss is there or not as a matter of fact somebody is taking private notes about you private notes about you you might not know when but the day they will bring out your notes you'll be so shocked that they have they know so much about you now let's go to the second one we talk about the conies the conies the bible says it said conies are but a feeble folk yet they make their houses in the rock it said the conies are but a feeble feeble folk yet they make their houses in the rock when we talk about something being feeble we talk about it being fragile something weak and something not so strong the conies are you know are similar to rodents and um, they're more classified in form of rabbits so to say but they are very weak i mean their back legs are weak so they're not very fast so like an air that can outrun i don't know his, his predator so to say you see when i read that scripture and he said, in, they make their houses in the rock. <laughs> what comes to my mind is our fragility and dependency on God. We know Christ is the rock and the rock of our salvation. We know God is the rock that, you know, that we can depend on. It talks about the rock. He said, if the rock falls on somebody... He said, sorry, if the soul falls on the rock, the rock the, that person is broken to pieces. And if, if it falls on somebody, that person is gathered to powder. So we're talking about the rock. The rock is an everlasting one. But more importantly, the Bible is talking about in this scripture, I believe, is positioning. Where are you positioned? For where your heart is, your treasures will also be. The Bible says that. We know that from scriptures. It's in Matthew 6 verse 21. Where your heart is, <laughs> your treasures also be there. Where your treasures is, your heart will be there. Somebody, your, your safety or your um, dependency is in your bank account. In your doctor, he's a specialist. Yeah. Your job, because you work for a multinational company. Like I see they can never fold up. Some people is their education. Some people is their husband. Some people is their wife. And they put their safety into it. But you see, all those things can fade away, but there's a God that never fades away. That's what the Bible says. It says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. I love the hymn song from the back in the day when we, we, when we were younger. We sing the song. I don't know if they're still singing these days. We say, rock of ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself in thee. And let the water and the blood... I'm not a singer, please. So don't, don't take that anyhow. Praise God. So what am I saying? Ladies and gentlemen, is that where are we positioned determines what is allocated to us or how we are seen in life. And what do I mean by this? Now, studying the story of Zacchaeus in the books of Luke chapter 19. Zacchaeus in the books of Luke chapter 19. Now, if you read the story properly, you will find that that Zacchaeus ran ahead of Jesus Christ. Now, Zacchaeus had what you would call some kind of um, shortcoming, for he was a short man of a small stature, so to say. But that did not stop him from getting himself positioned in anticipation of Jesus coming. Now, Zacchaeus then ran ahead and then he climbed up a sycamore tree. 
Sometimes you have to get ahead of life and let life catch up with you in many places, in many phases of your life. When Noah was building the ark, nobody's ever seen the rain before or seen rain fall from heaven before. So people were laughing at him. You see, sometimes you have to be the trailblazer. You have to be the pathfinder. You have to be the point, the one leading. Your ideas might sound obscure, as, as in, it's crazy, so to say. Nobody thought it's possible to ever carry a phone in your pocket. Nobody ever thought it's possible to invent a computer. But some people thought outside the box. Some people even said, let's forget the box and just think. So Zacchaeus ran ahead and went up a sycamore tree, which gave him a higher position than any man standing. Very rarely do you see a man taller than a tree, a fully grown tree. And then Jesus saw him, looked up at him and said, Zacchaeus, today salvation comes to your house. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in a season where we will start getting ourselves ready. Because, like I said earlier, the cycle of the stock market is a boom and bust one. What are you doing in anticipation of the next boom? What are you doing getting yourself ready so that you will take full advantage of it? Like I've said earlier, that luck is simply a lucky man or a favored man, because we are Christian, is a man who has prepared. And when he has prepared enough, when opportunity comes, is able to take full advantage of it. I believe this, that from the Cody's we can learn two important things. One, build your house solidly in Christ, the rock of ages. And number two, um, position yourself for the things ahead. Next week we deal with the, um, the locusts and the spider. I believe you've learned something today. I believe that God himself has been speaking to you. And some of us are going to go back home because we are hearers and doers of the world. That's what we are in living in the World International Church. We are hearers and doers of the world. So go back home, reflect on the sermon. Sometimes you have to play it back again. So put it in your car, play it back and back again. And I believe God himself will begin to speak to you. God bless you. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Shall we rise up to our feet? In the precious name of Jesus. Father, we give you glory. We give you praise. We magnify you because you're faithful and all power belongs to you. Thank you, Lord, for thus far you have helped us in this series of teaching. How you have taught us the fruit of the Spirit, all nine of them. Thank you, Lord, for maturing the fruit in our lives. We give you glory and praise. We bless your holy name because you are the doer. You are the one that is building us up. You are the one that is strengthening us. My Lord and my God, and I pray that the words that we have heard today will not stand against on judgment day i pray each and every one of us will go forward in our walk with you the fruit of the spirit in our lives will be greatly developed matured in our lives and i pray jesus that each and every one of us will receive a divine visitation in this season oh lord thank you my master for answering of prayer we give you glory and honor in jesus mighty name we have prayed amen praise god